Dras Rapis is going to prison for life. Nicholas Nenau pleaded for leniency because of his troubled past. But the trauma and damage he caused to his seven-year-old victim was deemed far worse. The comment on the sentence we have in studio, criminal lawyer Roman Tambelin, who's also an advocate of the High Court. And online, joining us via Skype, we've got Eugene Ellers, who's from the South African Society of Psychiatrists. And uh, perhaps I should start off with you, um, especially, Roman, looking at how this court procedure actually, you know, went by. And, and considering the fact that various political parties were calling for an even harsher sentence, do you think that was justifiable? Yeah, I, no, I think on the basis of the offense, it was uh, justifiable. And you saw that the judge tried to actually so hard to try and uh, strike the balance between the interest of the society and the interest of the accused himself. But, you know, that's a correct point that, you know, uh, due to the outcry and what is currently happening in our society, mm. you know, the political, party in the political parties in their own rights were justified, actually, to ask for even a harsher sentences. Looking at the circumstances of the case, we saw what transpired when the first you know, you know, you know, visuals were seen mm. about what, you know, what happened to the, to the poor child and everyone else was up in arms about you know, that justice must not only be seen to be done, but it must be done in this case, ultimately. Eugene, I'm going to bring you into this conversation because, I mean, uh, one such Nenau actually was threatening to commit suicide. Should he be found or should he be sentenced to life? Do you think that this is a threat that we should be taking seriously as the general public and also law enforcement considering the mitigating factors? Well, I mean, there are two things about it. The first one is, is it, is it, would the suicide be due to mental illness or would the suicide just be manipulative? So I think it is important to note that, you know, one should actually distinguish between the two. So if a person makes a threat of suicide, um, you know, in terms of, yes, you know, one could actually think that it might be more manipulative than due to mental illness. If it's due to a mental illness, that's a different story. And then that is really should be taken seriously, yes. It's about those who've been left behind. We've got about three victims here, and one is the former fiancé who will now forever have the label of being the fiancé of the convicted rapist. We've got the newborn child who was born whilst uh, Nina was actually incarcerated himself, and who will always bear the DNA of that individual who was rapist. So if considering that and the fact that the families have to now pick up the pieces, how do they do so, especially in the fact that this has been a largely publicized case? Yeah, it's, it's difficult. What you're saying is important, is the, you know, uh, you know, the cuts, you know, goes much more deeper in, in terms of what you have actually explained that we are not uh, no, we as a society are looking at one person mm. but there are other you know, parties that are actually involved that you have referred to the fiance there and the child that was born and then the scar that this child will actually carry through his life through the association of the father of what has actually happened you know, and as a result of the case that received a lot of uh, publicity but when we balance that against the interest of the society, looking at the, at, at the victim as well, you know, it, you know we, we have to actually see what is in the best interest of society relating to you know, justice and justice being served, looking at the entire you know, society and you know, the offense that was actually committed. Because you, you would have seen that the judges actually indicated that this is a serious offense, and then as a society now, we are facing a challenge of this type of cases. If it's not you know, murders of females, if it's not rape and then you know, abuses, we find these kind of cases. So at, at a certain point, the courts, you know, the, the public and the society that we're actually talking about has to rely on the courts to actually meet out the, you know, the punishment and the sentences so that at least the, that kind of you know, trust in the justice system is actually brought back. Mm. I think that is what is important as well. And Eugene, I mean, looking at it from a psychological perspective, I mean, the actual ramification, the psychological ramifications of this entire proceeding, never mind to the survivor who's now eight years old, but to the family, that's, the families that have been involved, the society that's been really affected by this ongoing case. Um, are we actually truly aware of the ramifications and psychological effects of such a case? We try to be bad people, childhood traumas are bad for people, and this is a trauma for everybody. And it's a trauma for the perpetrators, it's a trauma for each 
Okay, we well, seems like we are struggling to reach a signal there with uh, our psychiatrist Eugene, but do not fret. I mean, I'm going to ask you this. I mean, it comes to you know the psychological ramifications of it. I mean, looking at the fact that this has been a highly publicised case, but more than that, even the psychological effects, it's the issue around it also brings us an opportunity to perhaps even look back at some of those cases where people did not feel as though justice was served, especially when it comes to rape. Yes, indeed. No, you're, you're actually you know, correct in relation to that, that it carries a huge uh, psychological trauma. Unfortunately, you know, that other gentleman was un, uh, unable to actually respond in relation to that. But what you're saying is important because it, you know, it's not only when the sentence has been actually given, but actually what happens after the sentence mm -hmm. in terms of you know, the you know, perpetrator being reformed himself. And you have just indicated currently now that there was a threat that he indicated that he's going to kill himself if he's given even a life sentence, and this is a real you no know, challenge or a threat, you know, in terms of him threatening to injure himself, in terms of you know uh, the results of the case, and you know the case did not go in his favour. So, what is going to actually happen next? And the issue which the judge considered, which was quite important for me, was that he indicated that in terms of remorse and changing yourself, it starts with yourself, and if you have not actually actualized it yourself we are going to actually have a challenge because it was indicated that even in his span when he's now incarcerated before the sentence was handed down and the trial was going on, he was continuing on, on the drugs mm -hmm. you know, inside prison. So it says something about the psychological you know, you know, you know, effects that you know, this thing carry and whether as a society we shouldn't be looking at that holistically in terms of how we actually you know, make men to be aware in terms of the respect of you know, rights of women in terms of you know how they behave around them, you know, as a, as a general rule across the board. I was also very um, uh, surprised. I mean, delightfully surprised at the fact that um, even the judge was questioning the intention behind reciting the poem. So, whereas individuals may have seen it as a sign of remorse, the judge was saying that no, that doesn't necessarily indicate that you're remorseful by you reciting a poem as such. No, you're correct. You know, the judge was not impressed. You know, at all. You know, he's an experienced judge, and he has given a very valued judgment trying to balance the interest of the accused against the interest of the society and you see he spoke about deviating from the normal circumstances and he said I don't find anything here as much as I try hard to look so that I can deviate from you know, normal sentencing that are prescribed in terms of the uh, prescribed minimum sentences act I, I can't find anything so instead of that actually helping him of reciting a poet you know let's rather recite a poet on our daily lives basically in respect of women in the walks of life that we actually do in our workplaces you know where we interact with women and he has given a lot of examples of you know the government and the money that is being spent to try and 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 do the issues of you know pertaining to women and uh, you know fight against abuse of women and he has given also an example of 16 days of activism so that's important that uh, you know we need to relook at those things and and it's not about the issue of you know, just you know, reciting a poem and then when you think that now the, you know, the judgment day has, you know, is recalling and then he, the judge took that as playing for the gallery. He was not impressed at, at, at all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, I mean, as you and I were both speaking about yeah. the fact that unfortunately it's now about those who appear to pick up the pieces. Mm -hmm. Now that this case has actually concluded and uh, the proceedings and sentencing has actually been handed down, but uh, they're still lives and they're still victims of this entire saga that need to literally pick up the pieces in the public eye yes. and continue. Rome, we're going to leave our conversation there for this afternoon, but thanks all for joining us. Thanks. Shedding some light, really, as we analyze really a public case there um, when it comes to the handing down of a sentence uh, to one such uh, Nicholas Ninao.